Hydroxychloroquine, as we know, is commonly used for rheumatoid arthritis and lupus and Sjogren's syndrome and some other rheumatologic conditions. And common, uh, most common dosage is 400 milligrams daily. We, we have some more recent evidence that the toxicity uh, rate is a bit higher than we had previously thought. It, it approaches about 1% at five to seven years of use. In addition to toxicity, we, we also know that there's an acute effect on the photoreceptor metabolism, and then there, there is some concentration of the medication within the um, RPE melanin. It's not entirely clear whether that um, promotes toxicity or is protective from toxicity or neither. Uh, this is a patient um, on, with amblyopia in the right eye on Plaquenil, um, and this is an example of a, a the, the time frame that we would typically catch this toxicity in the past, um, this patient did have significant changes on their uh, their their 10-2. Their color um, photos, their exam were pretty much pretty unremarkable. But um, this is a red 10-2. Um, we we used to use red 10-2s and white 10-2s, um, sort of no particular. Uh, reason. The, the red, um, there's some earlier studies that show it might be a little bit more sensitive. The stimuli are closer to the threshold. But as anyone who's read these knows that there's a lot of, um, uh, there's a lot of artifact. It's tough to, to know what you're looking at. In this case, you see a nice, um, nice um, ring scotoma surrounding the center of vision. But so you see that. You take another look closer. You still don't see much on exam when you go back. Uh, we used to have fluorescent angiography, which was quite helpful, helpful to show areas of um, RPE rarefaction or, or, or loss. You see some uh, window defect right here, and that really is supportive of your diagnosis. It's still a bit disconcerting to make this make this call just on one modality, but um, this is what we what we had in the past. Um, you take a look at the FA. You still can't quite see where this this spot was on color photos. Now we have spectral domain OCT, which has helped immensely. This, this picture here shows some photoreceptor disruption. Um, as, as far as terminology, I'll, I'll use the ISOS junction for this line in the um, outer, um, the photoreceptor outer segment RPE junction for the line right below that. And we'll talk about that a little bit more. But just in general, there's some photoreceptor disruption here and here. Uh, and there and there on the right eye and in the left eye, which we um, had unimpressive findings otherwise, has very significant photoreceptor changes as well um, on spectral domain OCT. Fundus autofluorescence of this patient also showed this area that we identified with the angiogram, but also shows some hyper autofluorescence surrounding this area with um, the 488 um, fundus autofluorescence. Multifocal ERG showed a central depression here of the waveforms. And when you look at the, the anatomic imaging in a multi-modality uh, fashion, you can see this little area of debris above the RPE and subretinal that corresponds with this area and the area on the fundus autofluorescence. There's some sort of hypoautofluorescent modeling and then some surrounding hyperautofluorescence. It's tough to see this part because there's a vessel there as well. But this is very, very clear-cut toxicity. You watch the ISOS junction, it just drops out right in this region right here. And then the ELM looks pretty good, but in this area you also have some outer nuclear loss as well. So in light of this new understanding of the, the incidence of toxicity being higher than what we had previously thought, and in light of some of the new testing, uh, the Academy of Ophthalmology review, uh, released some new recommendations for screening for hydroxychloroquine toxicity. They, they changed the, the risk factors that we would look for for toxicity, and I'll go over that in a moment. But they also recommend, in addition to the white 10-2 um, visual fields, they made a recommendation to add one other test that they identified as objective, which are the autofluorescence, the, um, spe the OCT, spectral domain OCT, or the multifocal ERG. What they identified based on a couple of um, preceding studies was the accumulated um, dose of 1,000 grams um, for hydroxychloroquine uh, was a range above which you really started seeing toxicity. Daily dose over 400, 400 being the standard dose. And importantly, they identified that for short individuals, um, that, that the dose of 400 might be a little bit higher. So for short individuals, they'd be at a bit higher risk. 
The dosing ideally for hydroxychloroquine is based on ideal body weight. Um, so someone who's um, under five feet, for example, um, their ideal body weight, regardless of their actual weight, would be lower and they might need to be dosed down. The, um, even if they're um, larger uh, and obese, the, the, um, this medication is not distributed in fatty tissues. Elderly patients, patients with renal or liver dysfunction or potentially uh, macular diseases also may be at higher risk. And the patients that I just show you actually had a total cumulative dose of 3,800 grams. Non-recommended screening tests um, were fundus photography for, as we saw, um, very, very late changes. Time domain OCT is not adequate to catch these changes that we've identified on OCT. FA um, is helpful in some situations, but it's not as good as some of the other. It's equal or worse than some of the other tests that we have that are non-invasive, so it's not particularly helpful. Full field ERG is not a great test for this except for advanced phases. Um, Amsler grid, patients aren't very good at this for such a slow progression in contrast to quickly changing um, macular conditions that we use this test for. Color testing, we don't know. Um, we don't have good data, although we don't have good data on the newer tests either, but um, it's really unclear what color testing adds to the, to the formula. So um, this is a paper Mike Marmer put out that showed multimodality testing. And we know that we can pick these severe tox toxicity cases up pretty easily. The moderate toxicity cases um, are not always um, a challenge to catch. But what we want to do is catch these patients as early as we can. And what, he, what they looked at is with this white 10-2, um, if you took the smallest change to mean something, you could catch some of these early toxicity cases. But as we know from these 10-2 visual field tests, it's very common for normal patients to have um, scattered spots here and there. Multifocal ERG is very good at catching some of these patients. Um, um, SDOCT can show parafoveal thinning and also some of the anatomic changes we discussed briefly. Autofluorescence is plus minus. Sometimes you can find very good evidence early and sometimes you don't see much early. This shows the spectrum of the, um, um, the perimetry changes. And right here, this is considered abnormal on the right eye on this patient. When we get more progressive changes, this is quite, becomes quite obvious. But in these early patients, you have to take any change as being significant. And that's why we don't like basing um, such an important medication off just this one test. This is, shows a, an example of some of the changes, um, progressive changes that you see at the OCT, whereas here you just see some photoreceptor changes. In advanced phases, you start seeing um, outer nuclear loss in addition to the photoreceptor changes, and then at late phases, you see complete loss of um, the, the photoreceptor structures. Rick Spade um, and his group looked at, um, it, did some anatomic correlations to uh, these OCT findings, and they're trying to identify what we're actually looking at here. When it comes down to it, it doesn't particularly matter in this condition, but what we know is this third line, the first one being the ELM, the second one being either the ellipsoid section of the IS, what we commonly call, call the ISOS junction, or this third line, which is the cone outer segment contact cylinder, or the outer segment RPE um, junction. This, this third line is often what we see disappearing first, although this, this is a high mag, we can't see it well there, but this line right here, and following that, the ISOS junction changes a bit. Um, with autofluorescence, as you can see here, these patients have very minimal changes. Even this patient right here with moderate toxicity by other modalities um, has minimal change. In advanced phases, we see the characteristic bullseye that we know. Um, but, so this is plus or minus. It's a non-invasive test, so it's helpful to get, um, uh, and sometimes it's quite helpful. Multifocal ERG has a variety of patterns that you can see with this toxicity. This is an example of a normal, normal multifocal ERG with relatively normal waveforms. A common, commonly seen early change in the multifocal ERG, you have a normal central waveform, but the parafoveal areas have some depression in their amplitude. Right here you see more diffuse changes in the waveforms with, with or without preservation of the central waveform. And sometimes um, 
sometimes you see just a central defect as we showed in that first case. Interestingly, in patients who have been on uh, hydroxychloroquine a shorter time, sometimes they, they show a more peripheral change in these and decreased waveforms that's not felt to be toxicity. Um, it can be a very sensitive test. The problem with um, electrophysiology in general is there's, there can be a, up to 30% vari variability from test to the next test. So what we, uh, what's helpful in this situation, unless you have a particularly striking pattern, is to have some sort of objective means by which to look at these, these waveforms. There's a ring ratio analysis that Lyons uh, established that looks at the ratio from the center amplitude to the rings immediately surrounding. Most helpful are the second and third rings. They do a summed amplitude and measure it from the bottom of the trough to the peak here, and um, they use that value and do a ratio um, to, to identify pathologic changes in this condition. Although we know that the amplitudes in general decrease as you go on in life, for a 20 to 29 year old, it was 40, and by the time you get to 60 or 70, it's 12.5 and 5.5. But fortunately, these ratios between the first segment and the inner rings uh, remain the same. So as you can see, for the ratio of one to three, it's 4.5 all the way through life. And this can be helpful um, uh, if, there's, if there are equivocal results with other tests. So I'd like to show a patient here. Commonly, um, with, with our comfort level with OCT these days in spectral, or, or spectral domain OCT, it's, we're tempted to rely just heavily on the OCT, but this is an example of a patient who is asymptomatic, slight vision changes, but the cataract was felt to um, account for this. This patient was four foot 11, so although she was 151 pounds, her ideal body weight would be closer to 100 pounds, yet she was re receiving 400 milligrams a day for 15 years. Right there, that piqued our interest, and we were gonna look pretty closely at this patient. The fundus autofluorescence was unremarkable. Exam was unremarkable, as we would expect. Spectral domain OCT, if you look carefully, you can see um, sort of a moth-eaten, irregular appearance of the parafoveal ISOS junction here. And if you start temporally, you can see that this third line, um, the outer segment RPE junction, does disappear once you get to about here. <coughs> Likewise, on the other eye, you see similar findings. Uh, however, this isn't overly impressive. It would be tough to stop someone on a medication um, that's, that's helping them quite a bit. We look at the 10-2 um, white. This is this is quite helpful actually. The supranasal quadrants in these are the place that you most commonly see the early defects. And this patient has some supranasal defects as well as some um, ring-shaped defects as well. Going to the multifocal ERG, this is a beautiful pattern, a beautiful example of this parafoveal um, suppression of the amplitude. We did a ring ratio calculation, and in the right eye here, it was the ratio of one to three was 4.4, which is greater than two standard deviations from the norm. In the left eye, 3.4 here, that's fairly significant too, but not quite as much so. So in sum total, we were able to confidently discuss with the patient that this, this suggests that they have toxicity and make a plan going forward. What's our protocol in general? Uh, about a year ago, we established a protocol whereby baseline testing was white 10-2. They get spectralis OCT with 20, uh, 20 degree rasters radially oriented and uh, fundus autofluorescence, which you can do at the same machine. So this is, it's quick that they can get both of those at the same time. At year five, they would repeat the same testing, and then if there was chronic use, if someone's been on it a very, very long time, if there, the testing was otherwise equivocal, we'd get multifocal ERG. We'd have a low threshold to do this if we had concerns, but not everyone would get it. So the goal with this multimodality screening is to identify patients with clear toxicity as soon as possible, and using multiple modalities increases the sensitivity. Um, identifying a lack of toxicity in patients who have previously been stopped on these medications is actually critically important too. I have a list of patients, um, uh, over 10 patients that have previously been stopped the new, that we were able to confidently say, you can restart this medication with caution um, because they, they, um, they came back and they didn't have any evidence of toxicity on these newer exams. Most commonly, someone will have a few little pigment changes um, in the macula and it was stopped for that reason. There's 
one patient in particular, it was stopped, she had her medication stopped for some pigmentary changes, and subsequent for, she was on the hydroxychloroquine for lupus, she ended up um, needing a renal transplant very soon after she stopped the medication, and then her, um, she had a transplant, and the second kidney was failing, and at that point we were able to say, you know what, some of these pigmentary changes are more consistent with central serous chorioretinopathy. She's able to go back on the medication, and we'll see how she does. There are certain situations where it's quite helpful to, to do the opposite, to say, actually, there is no evidence of toxicity at this point. We don't have any good validation of these recommended protocols, but what we can say is having additional tools is quite helpful in this situation. So one last slide. When should the medication be stopped? Well, um, you have to consider the systemic condition, stability, current medications, et cetera. Often we would stop it right away because these medications last in your system for quite a while, up to four to six months. There's some situations, however, if someone's systemic status is a bit tenuous, that would, I would most commonly say, let's get an appointment set up with your rheumatologist or dermatologist, whoever you're seeing, most commonly the rheumatologist if it's a severe situation. And then once they have a plan to go forward, that they can stop the medication when they get their new medication. Because because, you know, 5,475 versus 95 days on the treatment is probably not going to make a big difference long term. But if you stop the medication, you have systemic complications, you could be in trouble. Thanks again. I appreciate everyone coming. Um, and I, we have one more talk? One more. Excellent. <laughs>